Welcome to everyone. Uh, sorry for the late start on that, and it's great to have you with us for the session today. Um, the Oklahoma Compost Conference started just a few years ago uh, with a group of people, and I'm Mark Walvert. I'm one of them that's on that planning committee. Uh, it was just back in 2015, actually. Uh, we thought it was high time to bring together communities and businesses in the state of Oklahoma, as the name implies, uh, to discuss how compost can benefit us all um, and also benefit the environment. And over the past five years, we've been able to have an annual conference. So every year, uh, an in-person one with attendees from local governments, construction, solid waste, municipalities, students, homeowners. Uh, we've got a diverse set of folks that come each year. Uh, and we're really stoked to be able to offer this year uh, virtually instead of um, face to face. And so we appreciate you all joining us instead of for a one day in person conference, these four sessions that we've had over time and this one uh, postponed from last Thursday to this Thursday. So a big thanks to you all for uh, being flexible and joining us here and the panelists and moderator for doing the same. Um, you saw the sponsors scrolling by, I hope on that PowerPoint. So just a shout out to them. Um, the platinum level sponsors, Eleva Soils, Keep Oklahoma Beautiful, City of Midwest City, uh, Prairie Dirt Solutions, at Gold Level, Oklahoma City Beautiful, Ideal Homes, and we had some in-kind sponsors, Oklahoma Department of Environmental Quality, University of Central Oklahoma, Oklahoma Recycling Association, and Fertile Ground Co-op. So a big thanks to them, and you can find their names and links on our uh, website if you ever want to get back to what they do. Uh, if you have questions during this session today, this one is a little bit different than the other three. It's going to be more like a panel discussion. Um, and so you might be thinking of questions as we go along. I encourage you to use the chat feature um, there at the bottom of Zoom to send a question to the panelists. And when there's a breaking point, the moderator will jump in and try to get those uh, questions answered in the order they come in. Um, so we encourage you to do that. If, if you know they're just going and there's so much good info, um, you're not thinking of asking questions, we will try to leave, you know, a quick five, 10 minutes at the end, uh, in case you think of some towards the end that you want to ask so we can get a little bit more interactivity. So um, that's how we're going to interact and do some questions. Uh, one tech issue we had, you know, a month ago when we were trying is when people got kicked out, they said they had trouble getting back in. Well, after three or four tries, they got back in. So if some reason you have weak internet, get kicked out. Use that same link. You should be able to rejoin us. We'll still be here, um, 12.05 to 1.05 or so, probably. Uh, and with that, I'm sure you've got the craving to get started. So I'm going to turn it over to our moderator for today to introduce himself and the panelists. Take it away, Jason Huffaker. Well, good afternoon to everybody. And again, to reiterate what Mark was saying is we really appreciate everybody being patient and rejoining again this week. In fact, we still have several people who wanted to attend today that are either out of power still or have internet issues. Uh, but the good news is that uh, we are here and we're live and we're rolling. Um, as Mark said, I'm, I'm Jason. I am here representing the Oklahoma Compost Conference today. I've been with the, with the, uh, the group since day one, proud of that. Um, and then also I'm part of Eleva Soils and Prairie Dirt Solutions, who's a sponsor today. And um, again, happy to be here, looking forward to our discussion today. With us today, we also have um, Chris with Redbud Soil Company, uh, and we're glad to have him. He has uh, extensive knowledge in the cannabis industry, as well as um, uh, creating and, and growing living soils um, with a vast knowledge in compost. We've got Bruce with uh, Aurora Innovations, Roots Organics here today to answer some questions about maybe uh, different types of compost they use or in their soils. And then we've got Bryce Davis with us today from Cola Organics, again, with a lot of knowledge in the growing side of the cannabis industry and the use of compost. So welcome you three today. We appreciate you being a part of this. And so, um, I guess you can see here, they see what's on the screen, is that correct? So the PowerPoint's rolling. You know, Eleva Soils is all a firm believer in, in elevating soil health. I'm not going to bore you with my stuff. Prairie Dirt Solutions, we, uh, I'm proud to be a part of that. We've got one of the largest compost, uh, commercial composting uh, uh, pad sites in the Oklahoma area. Um, maybe we can help you out with your compost needs there. Um, go ahead to... Uh, the next slide. 
We're going to show you a little bit real quick here. We're going to move forward so we can get to as much questions as we possibly can today. Um, we're going to hit a quick video here on how large scale, large scale composting is accomplished. Um, I hope the video is starting. Is it? So quickly, that was just an, that was in a, uh, a demonstration of how we are able to aerate and um, uh, disperse all the particles in the composting process as needed so that we can achieve proper temperatures. Again, we want to be above 131 degrees. Uh, after that, we are killing pathogens and we're creating a good uh, fungal and bacteria uh, type environment for the, 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 for the colonization and, the, um, and also for a, a quicker uh, composting process. Then after that, we go to the next video, which is where we're going to take the wind. is that enables us to take the, the uh, entire windrow, put it through the screen that you see there, that's called a trommel screen, and you're able to come up with different particle sizes. In, in compost, um, you know, if you're going to top dress your yard, you may want a different um, particle size of compost than if you're going to put it into soil where you may want more aeration capable capabilities. So by putting it through different size screens, we're able to um, supply compost and different, different particle sizes for different uses. Um, that said, we got Bruce. Bruce, he was born in the Philippines. Um, currently, he's up in Michigan. Um, and he has been with Roots Organics for a while now um, and been in organic growing for many years. Um, has a vast knowledge in organic nutrients and um, different types of growing uh, different ways of growing cannabis, and he'll be here today with us to help uh, any questions you may have in that area. We also have with us today, as I was saying earlier, we got Bryce Davis. He is with Cola Organics. Um, he, uh, after graduating college, went to the NFL, uh, did, a, did a few years in the NFL. He's one of our stars here in Oklahoma. He'll be able to sign autographs at some point for us. And um, then went into growing cannabis in Oregon and then came to back to Oklahoma, his home, his home state, and has a, a very productive grow here in Oklahoma. And he's going to be able to answer a lot of questions for us today and tell us a lot about how he grows organically. And then we've got Chris. Chris is uh, from, well, I know him from Colorado. Now he lives here. Um, Chris has been in the industry for many years um, and has um, developed a living soil that is second to none in the industry. He's very respected uh, in Colorado and Oklahoma and, and in even other states. Uh, does a lot of um, uh, um, consulting and, and is able to help people with a, a small growth for the, the personal use all the way up to huge commercial growth. So, Chris, thanks for being with us today. So in the last many years, we found that, excuse me, I've been a little under the weather this week and <clears throat> I'm, uh, I'm trying not to cough on you here. We found that uh, obviously traditional ways of growing our food and, and so forth uh, has taken the carbon out of the soil. It's created different plants, diseases and, and this and that. And so we've as a as a uh, as a commercial grow in, in produce or whatever the case, foods industries, um, we've developed the need for what we what I call nozzle heads, where we spray or we apply commercial fertilizers and we try to mimic what Mother Nature does. And um, we've been able to do that, but also with, in, in, in the opinion of many, um, we've done that by um, lessening the quality of our food and so forth. And so we believe that obviously the, the more the soil health, the better the plant, the better the end result. And we're finding that also in the cannabis industry. And we'll talk a little bit about more of that today. Um, the difference in cannabis uh, grown compost emitted versus soils or, e or even a hydro or aqua 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 a
I'm going to throw that back to the panelists. So let's start with uh, let's start with Chris. Chris, um, what have you seen as the difference in growing in say a quality organic soil versus um, aquaponic or a hydro system? Um, so the number one thing I see terpenes, just straight up. Um, we have a lot of customers that are testing six and seven percent terps out of our soil once it's aged. Um, our average customer on one, two, three cycles get three and four percent terps without doing anything. Zero work, nothing. The soil does it all. Uh, it's really to me about introducing the correct microbes via compost in the soil from the beginning and then to continue to feed those throughout the process and let that soil age. And um, as far as cannabis goes, yes, the terpenes are a great end product of, of taking care of that living soil, um, but your labor costs are reduced. Uh, you know, water is next to nothing. Uh, the water retention is just insane. Um, you know, when I give examples to people on how much we water, let's, for instance, um, I actually made a YouTube video this morning uh, it'll be up in a few days. Um, and we water uh, a four by four living soil bed, I put two gallons of water in it Monday. I put two gallons of water in it Wednesday. I put two gallons of water in it Friday. That's it. And none of the water ever leaves the bed. Not one drop hits the ground. And that's all because of the microbes and the compost and the organic matter in the soil. So again, pushing the fact about the, the, the organics in that soil is what's doing that moisture retention and, and, and also creating that ecosystem in the soil. It is, and the, and the more that soil ages, the less and less you'll water. So that example I use that I'm using two gallons in a four by four bed, that soil is about a year and a half to two years old in that soil bed. Okay. And so, and so you know, maybe um, when that soil's brand new, you'll use another half gallon or a gallon, but as that, you know, so we use worms and we have microbes that we add and we have uh, insects that we add and things like that. And so ours is a continual compost pile our beds are. So we don't just add compost one time, we're creating it inside right. uh, the pot or whatever. And so as it produces, it just turns more and more and more. And so, you know, you can imagine when this turns into like five-year-old soil in the same container, or seven-year-old soil in the same container. Um, it, it's a pretty, it turns into a pretty amazing product and it's all based off the composting process over those years. You mentioned um, big time difference in terpenes. Can you explain what a terpene might be for us that don't know? Yeah, so, uh, you know, terpene are just essential oils that are found in plants, um, and terpenes create the entourage effect. Um, the entourage effect is just, you know, THC does one thing, CBD does one thing, but let's say you um, smoke a strain that makes you sleepy. Well, you know, it's the terpenes that, have, that, that coexist with the cannabinoids um, that make that, that, to give you that, uh, that feeling that you want. And, and so, you know, the higher the terpenes, the, the better the effects, whatever that effect may be based off whatever terpene that is. Um, and so I see a lot of people, uh, it's kind of funny. I saw a hydro guy post the other day. He's like, I got 1.6% terps. What? Like our, I mean, just straight out of the bag, our soil will get you three and 4% terps with like doing nothing. So that's, so. That, there's where I was heading with that. So to, to, if I understand you correctly, what you're saying is, compost in the soil versus growing hydro is going to create terpene, a higher terpene level, just because we're using compost and not just hydroponics. Is that correct? Yeah, just it's the living soil system in general and, and living soil means it's alive and the microbes and compost and all that are part of that. Um, you know, I, I do see hydro guys trying to, you know, add, I don't know any names, I've never grown hydro, but let's just go with Terp Blaster 5000. And they throw it in the last two weeks and they think they're gonna have really awesome terps and it doesn't work that way. Terps are built up through the entire life of the plant. Terps come from the soil. Um, you can try to artificially inflate your terp numbers, whatever you want to do, but we've all seen it where a hydro guy will harvest and it smells really awesome and it smokes halfway decent for about a week or two weeks and then it just falls off. And ours is the exact opposite. Ours gets better over time. So again, we're rather than trying to mimic mother nature, we are mother nature by using the compost and so forth. Bryce, what um, what have you seen with the compost in your in your grow? Um, have you ever have you ever grown without using compost, or have you always been a, a living soil grower? Uh, so I've always been a living soil grower uh, and developed my own soil from scratch. Uh, as far as incorporating compost back into that, I actually haven't had the luxury over the years to do that uh, based off of my space. Uh, so now I'm, I'm in a position where I'm actually getting to collect all my compost to where I can reuse that 
uh, and it be 100% cannabis derived. Um, so to my experience today, it's basically I have developed my soil uh, from the beginning and added my microbials and fungi. Um, and just like Chris said, the, the, main, the main difference in it is your terpene production. I would also say uh, another big difference in it is uh, it allows the plant to take what it wants when it wants, when you're talking about a nutrient, uh, where the vice versa side, you have people that are using synthetic fertilizers that when introduced into the water, the plant uptakes a very large amount of whichever nutrient you're talking about here, whether that's uh, uh, phosphorus or nitrogen, uh, potassium, any of the miners. Uh, but what I've noticed when people do use these, uh, it makes the plant grow abnormally fast in whatever it's trying to achieve, whether it's a stretch or a swell of the bud. Um, in that abnormal growth, you'll see bruising. Uh, you'll see hollow uh, insides of the plant where the stalk will be hollow, the bud will be hollow. Um, uh, that just makes for a weaker uh, structure altogether uh, when you're talking about the plant. Um, and I, that correlates into its terpenes and its cannabinoid profiles as well. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited to uh, see how my uh, product ends up changing over time as we're collecting this cannabis byproduct and incorporating it back into uh, the living soil, which we start from. Sweet, thank you. So Bruce, not gonna, we're not gonna forget you here. Um, you've also, you've done both hydro and organic uh, in soil using compost, um, but also grown hydro. Can you speak to a little bit of the, uh, the, the quality difference? I guess that's what Chris and Bryce are saying, obviously, is that they're seeing a huge quality difference um, from hydro versus a, a soil specifically using uh, quality compost in the blends. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, you don't even have to with the cannabis here. What you see in the grocery market, like you know, a nice big plum tomato. They don't, you know, a lot of times they don't taste like anything. A lot of those, are, you know, hydroponically grown tomatoes, cranked out. So you're getting the weight, you're getting the food, but at the same time, the quality goes down. Um, you see, like the how small of a section of the grocery store is actually the organic part of the grocery store, but that's actually the good stuff right there. Like you know, it takes a little bit more work sometimes, um, you know, but at the same time, the the benefit is the better flavors, better smells, you know, like healthier, happier looking plants. Um, where when you're growing like in the, in the soil, like Chris said, you, you are you are you're getting more benefit from what those microbes are doing than just a you know, typical like salt based line or a salt based nutrient. Gotcha. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a personally a big fan of using it like an amended mix because we make, you know, amended soils um, anywhere from like two to eight weeks worth of food. But then I'm a big fan of doing compost teas and like or amendments or top dresses on top of that and watering it. Um, but that's just my personal thing now that I like to do. Excellent. So <clears throat> we mentioned, uh, what is the name? Can can cannabinoids? Help me out, guys. What's the name of that? We, we mentioned cannabinoids. 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 Yeah, yeah. And for all of us that don't know all those fancy words, what's a cannabinoid? Cannabinoids. I'm looking at thinking more so that like the active components to like what we're actually growing to like. So aside from the terpenes, because like well, my focus more on the terpenes and the flavors and the smells, like THC is like uh, uh, tetrahydrocannabinoids. So THC is actually like the active ingredient in a sense. So it's all just different parts of the plan, different things that we're trying to uh, amplify. Gotcha. Okay. Um, another thing we've got, let's go to the next slide here. So, you know, one of the things we mentioned earlier is not all composts are created equal. Um, and there's a lot of different composts on the market, both commercially or in small batch. So um, can you guys speak to say a manure based compost versus a verma compost versus let's say a, a mulch type compost or a hardwood compost? Can you guys speak, can any, anybody have some, some input on or been involved with those differences? So I can uh, basically say everything you just listed is in our compost. So uh -huh. um, uh, we use a compost that's made out of uh, horse stall bedding. So we'll have a horse manure. Anybody that's grown mushrooms, that's a whole other conversation. But um, everybody knows that um, horse poop will yield large mushroom flushes. Um, it, it, it likes a fungal dominant um, substrate. Um, it, it helps bring a fungal dominance. That mixed with the straw 
And then our compost is mixed with a heavy wood chip product um, and then composted down. And now, so there's no vermicompost in that, but then we add that to the soil. And once you get our soil going in the containers, then you're gonna add worms and that's where the vermicomposting comes in. So literally everything you listed is exactly what I use. I use all of it through the whole process. Excellent, excellent. Well, that's good to hear because sometimes people, they say, well, I can't have manure based because it's no good, or I can't have it all wood based, or I only want vermicompost. So I'm glad to hear that that's in all of yours. Bryce, um, have you had anything, uh, have you used different types of compost or one that you prefer? Uh, you know, I've, I've had some experience early on coming back to Oklahoma, trying some different worm castings um, from what the plants were, or, or excuse me, from what the worms were eating. Uh, it drastically affected my soil and my end product. Um, so <clears throat> no, I don't, I don't have any personal experience collecting and reusing my compost and separating them out. Uh, but I do have experience on different types of castings that were used. Uh, and you are what you eat. Uh, the worms were eating the most organic material that they could eat possibly. Uh, and that's what I found to be the best. Um, you know, that, that, that's really the experience I have with it. Okay. So you prefer vermicomposting is what I'm hearing? Yes. Vermicompost, I mean? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And Bruce, what about you? I mean, you, from the, from the uh, commercial manufacturing side, uh, what do you guys uh, see and or use or prefer um, in your soils? I suppose like in 707 and you've got different types of soils out there. Is there different types of compost in all of your soils, Bruce? Hang on, Bruce, you gotta unmute yourself, buddy. Uh, we do have ports of compost materials well and you know, we're really, really some casting. Um, so, you know, we, we uh, the, what Bryce saying, like, you know, we, you, all eat, like, the, you know, the castings do make a difference and what you're actually feeding your inputs makes a difference in a sense, um, where, you know, like even the worms are getting, you know, a high quality feedstock along with, you know, food grade, you know, human food grade ingredients. Um, so it's, it, it's just aids to the overall like quality, I guess, um, manure wise, um, you know, like we do have, you know, chicken manure in some of our mixes, but as well as like in our amendments as well, um, there's different kinds of guano. We're heavy in the guano side. Um, as well as coca, uh, cocoa, pea, and perlite as the other parts of the soil, but there is a good amount of vermicompost and actual worm compost in the mixes. Um, and I'm a huge fan of like the top dress of the worm casting, or sorry, the top dress of the, like a tea brew with all the other inputs as well. Excellent. Excellent. So appreciate that knowledge. So I guess if I'm to wrap that up, I guess that uh, overall, listening to all of you, almost any compost is good compost. You've used it. Many people use it in different types of soils. Um, it sounds like a lot of people at the end result, we're looking for that vermicompost, whether we start with it like Bryce does or whether we produce it in our soil like Chris does. So excellent. So let's move ahead to that. So one of the things that we all know about compost, or at least that we I hope we all know, and if we don't, we're going to talk about it, is the water holding capacity of compost. And um, actually, different types of compost have um, different moisture holding capacities. So um, it's been shown that uh, worm castings actually hold more of its weight uh, in moisture than say um, other t uh, a ocean or excuse me, a, a, a uh, forest type compost. Um, that said, you know, one of the things we hear a lot about cannabis in, in particular is that, you know, it, it needs to uptake to grow and, and um, so we want to feed it as much as we can. So how do you guys uh, feel about compost and moisture retention? And is there such a thing as having too much compost in the soil and holding too much water for the plant? Um, I guess this time, let's start with, uh, with, with Bryce. We started with Chris last time. Uh, I would say most definitely, uh, compost can hold too much moisture when it comes to cannabis. Um, we actually try to allow our plants to dry out some to get more oxygen down into the root system. Uh, there is a very fine line uh, later in flower, there's a point of no return. So you don't wanna push that limit too much. Um, having a high quality compost though, it, for water retention is a great thing uh, to avoid that fine line. Uh, yeah, so, uh, Excellent. Yeah, it, it, once you hit that fine line of point of no return, you lose all yield. You lose the whole crop. It will never grow again. 
so I would say being a little heavy on that compost side for moisture retention would be a good thing. Uh, even though I do chase to try to be a little bit dry, uh, just so I can increase my humans. Sure. Bruce, what's, uh, what have you seen out there on um, moisture retention and compost volumes, I guess, by percentage in the soil? I mean, you guys produce a lot of different soils, whether, and in fact, you guys produce them to where maybe they hold more or less moisture. Can you speak to that a little bit for us? Yeah, and that's, that's what I was going to get at. Um, it depends on what style of growth you're doing, what, you know, what scale you're doing, how you're growing, um, how, how much you actually want to water. Um, us, for example, like our, our original mix is a higher cocoa mix, which, you know, equals more drainage in a sense. So um, that, that's a good indoor outdoor mix. But like if, if you did want the more retention, I would uh, push you more towards like our 707 or green fields, which has, you know, more like ocean inputs as well as different uh, compost elements in there that it just holds water a little bit longer. Um, so like it is huge and you don't want to grow a swamp, obviously. So like if you're making your own mixes, you, I mean, it's going to there's an ideal soil the plant will grow in and an ideal soil it won't. Um, but, you know, too, too much is, uh, like Bryce said, is a bad thing. So, so not all, if a little's good, a lot's better. It isn't always true, huh? Yeah, like, I mean, like, you don't want, it's there, like, there's that fine line right in the middle where you take, you're basically feeding as much as the plant wants at the same time as much as you want to feed as well, too. Right on, right on. Chris, you want to, do you want to shoot for the, the uh, stars here and, and wrap it up? You're 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 uh, you're you're the last batter on this. All one. right. So um, you know, if we're looking for a percentage to start out with the soil, uh, we like anywhere from 25 to 30 percent uh, compost to begin in a soil. Now that being said, uh, that to a lot of people, lay people or other people that maybe aren't as educated on living soil systems, that seems like a really heavy amount. Um, it's really not because if you think about it, once we get this pot going and once we put it in there with our worms and things like that it's gonna turn into 50, 60% vermicompost. It could turn into more than that over time. Um, so the fact that, um, you know, uh, can you have too much compost? I think you can have too much compost in the beginning, but as it ages naturally and it's a natural process, uh, it's just gonna do what it's gonna do. The, the forest floor does not have too much compost. You know, it doesn't stop producing composted material and humus because it's reached, reached a certain, uh, you know, percentage. Right. So we try to mimic that as much as possible. And as far as like oxygen to the roots and drying out and things like that, you know, our method of growing is always moist. Uh, we never have to worry about oxygen because we have live animals and critters in there creating channels. And sure. um, there's wicking and there's all kinds of natural processes that happen outdoors. I mean, um, we do nothing that is spectacular. All I do is look at Mother Nature and say, oh, that works. Let's do that over here. That's it. It's, it's that simple and it just works and the plant will have everything it needs um, and, and it'll be happy, healthy, thriving. It will re resist disease, it will resist pressure and you'll notice it will be amplified over time as those natural processes build via composting of the worms and the um, micro arthropods and arthropods in our containers. There you go with those big words. You know, I'm gonna have questions in the background now. What's the arthropods? Uh, just like, uh, roly polies, things like that. Just little things that break stuff up, you know? Holy now see, everybody knows what a roly poly is, Chris. But it's a pill bug, a sow bug, things like that. Um, you know, we have all those in our containers. Our containers are completely alive. Um, and we do that on purpose. We incorporate it all on purpose. Um, we can have spring tells. Uh, I wasn't used to it because of Colorado, but here you guys have a lot of earwigs. I'm finding a lot of earwigs in our soil. Um, that was a new one to me. Um, but all of that is contained in our soil. And, and we bring things in like hypoaspis miles, um, which is a predator, uh, nematodes, which is a predator, rove beetles, which are predators. Um, and then we have um, composting mites, we have worms, um, uh, tons of arthropods, microarthropods, different things, a lot of different uh, soil mites that break things down. So, I mean, the list goes on and on what's in our soil. And all they all are doing, all of that, is they're just eating stuff and pooping it out, making compost and feeding our plants. Right. So again, compost being great. So let's wrap that back into what is organic. So we, Bryce, you're growing organically um, and you're using, you're, you're doing the same thing Chris is doing. You're just doing it a, in a little different method. You're using all organic inputs. Um, Chris is using one, uh, all organic inputs as well. His soil just develops over a long period of time. Bruce, he supplies organic products. But the question is that's coming in is, what is organic when labeling cannabis? Is there a um, 
a rule? Is there, a, is there something out there that determines it is organic, Bryce? No, there is no rule currently. Um, you know, our name's Colo Organics. I tell everyone we're not 100% organic. Uh, there's there's uh, different reasons for that. I mean, one, taking clones on a production scale, you got to have successful rooting ratios. We use a uh, Clonex as a rooting hormone. Uh, that's a part of the pro process where the, uh, the plant actually starts. So right there, you can cut out 100% organic. Uh, but we do do 100% organic inputs into our soils. Uh, we do do 100% organic compost teas. Uh, we're big on not feeding the plants, kind of like Chris said, we feed our soil. Um, so right now there is no organic standard. Um, and if you're, if you're talking about someone doing a commercial grow, trying to keep up with high clone success rates, uh, I, don't, I don't really think that 100% organic company is out there yet. Uh, I might be wrong, but uh, that's just from my experience. Um, I, I started in this industry extremely raw. As you mentioned, I went into the NFL for three years. Um, and then when I quit the NFL, I moved out to Oregon. Luckily, I landed in three different places in Oregon. And uh, they were very health conscious when it came to organic food. Um, and that was something I wasn't used to here. Um, I was also very health conscious being a pro athlete. I also was an exercise science major. Um, so I was really big in nutrition and physique and uh, trying to uh, optimize my performance. Uh, so that kind of carried into when I went into Oregon, I landed right into a group of people that uh, they already understood soil health and uh, organic inputs. And that basically gave you a, a superior product in the end when we're talking about cannabis. Um, hmm. So yeah. much like growing an athlete, not a, not a person, you know, Correct. trying to get the, the best quality we can out of, out of mother nature. Correct. And I, I don't think all compost are created equal. Um, you know, uh, pH is a very important thing. Inputs is a very important thing. Um, and you know, what, what I found is, like I mentioned earlier from the, the worm castings, it's, it's all about what you're eat, eating. And, uh, the, the worms that I choose to use, they're all organic matter. Um, and in the end, it, it, it makes a great product. Excellent, thank you. Bruce, you got anything to input about that? Chris? Um, yeah. Organic is just the vaguest word, especially when it comes to cannabis, because there's no state certified like certifications you can get. They're all third party certifications. Um, they've been around for quite a while. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, it's since there's a lack of oversight, it's overused. Um, and, you know, being what we do and I deal with, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of growers on a monthly basis. Um, Everybody has their take on what organic is. It's not my place or anybody else's place to really dictate at this point. Um, I would say that it is possible to be 100% organic in a commercial grow. Um, there are ways to do that. We, I mean, we do, we have customers that do it. I teach people how to do it. Um, but again, that's a vague word and somebody can always pick, you know, your, your fabric pot's made out of plastic. Your water hose is made out of plastic. Like I could go down the line of things that really irk you sure, in a sure. grow, and there's nothing any of us can do about it. There's nothing any of us can do about right. it. We're constantly touching chemicals and petro, you know, petroleum products and things like that through the whole process. So again, me saying it's 100% organic, it's you know, take it with a grain of salt. It's unfortunate. We're uh, trying to get as close as we can, right? Yeah, that's and that's what everybody's doing, and that's really what you just strive to be as the best you can be you know, sure. and do the best for your customers. That's what's important. So one of the things I heard a minute ago was uh, compost tea. Uh, somebody brought up compost tea. So um, do you guys use compost tea? And, and if so, uh, what, how do you use it? And what are the benefits you have found from using it? Uh, who wants to go first? Anybody in particular? I mean, that's actually my, that's my personal favorite way to grow slash, uh, feed my plants in a sense, or you know, feed the dirt in a sense. Um, 
you know, like you know, uh, what we were just talking about before to uh, kind of touch back on that was when it comes to like the final product you're going and it comes to organics, it can be a loose word. Like, you know, cause like, like uh, Chris was saying, like, you know, like what kind of pots are you using? What kind of water are you using? You know, what other things are happening in that garden? Like, um, you know, we're, you know, obviously we're an organic company. So like when it comes from a, like a product, uh, I guess, prior to use standpoint, you know, this, this is a certified organic product, you know, this is something that, you know, we pretty much anything that's branded Roots Organics is fully CDFA certified. So it's uh, the California Defa the Department of Food and Agriculture, and they're they're you know pretty strict about what you know what they'll actually pass through in a sense. And we do that pretty much every year, and we do take a lot of pride in that. But again, like the end product, how do you test? You know, when you're depending on which garden, you know, a garden garden, there you, there's no real way to test. You know, obviously, like, oh, well, this is specifically organic. This is not. You know, it's really. Um, eventually, they may get there, but that's really again, it, it can be a loose world word and product, but the, the inputs that you're putting in do matter in a sense. Um, like, and, but and then when it comes to you know back to the teas, like the like the, well, we have you know one called turp tea, which you know there's guano, kelp, you know yucca, sucrose, you know beneficials, all in like in this uh, finely fine ground, like, you know, super micronized powder that you can use as like a main base feed or use it as a supplementary tea to pretty much any grow, even if you're running a living soil, you can still kind of supplement it in a sense with more microbes. Um, and I'm a huge fan of that. Like I'll actually argue that my turf, my, my tea grows in general are um, faster than like my hydroponic grows. Um, I just, there, I just, I'm a huge fan of like the actual rate of the growth, the health of the plants, like the final quality, um, you know, good flavors, good smells, good terpene profile. Um, but yeah, that's like, uh, depending, again, depending what media you're in, you, you know, that kind of changes how often you want to apply the teas. Um, like me, I do it like, uh, by, by the time, like my plants are in flowering, cause I'm a small container gardener. I'm not doing any big containers and everything or anything like that personally in my garden at home. Um, it depends on, um, I guess it's like by the time I'm in flowering, the, that soil is kind of like a little bit less food in there in a sense. And then it, it puts me in more control of what the plants are getting at that point in the plant's life. So you mentioned earlier uh, hydroponically, whether you're growing a tomato or a cucumber or whatever, uh, yeah. the, you know, the fruit's there, the, the, it's big, it's red, it's a tomato, but the flavor's gone or the nutrients are in that tomato like something grown organically. Do you use uh, turp teas in, in everything that you garden, not just the growth of cannabis? I, yeah, I, mean, I use turp teas as a, as, you know, it's a, it can be used as a dry or liquid and choose a lot of different ways and i'm always on the road so if, if sometimes when some weeks i just want to throw some turps on top and water it in and that's cool if i have time to brew it that's cool so i use it because it's more really beneficial um the last time i grew straight hydro was a few years ago and we have a you know a different product line called soul that's geared towards hydro where it's got you know it does have a good organic backbone to it you know guanos kelps and all the good stuff but does have that mineral backbone as well uh, so it's kind of like the the ease of a mineral nutrient like you know that are salt based nutrient that you see in a lot of hydro systems but with the quality of an organic um but that's less than like hydro but like the terps in general they're they're super broad how they can be used so i'm a big fan of those and pretty much anything i'm growing nowadays gotcha chris can you talk to turp teas for us um yeah so or compost tea i should yep, say yep yep this is going to be a lengthy thing here because uh luckily enough 10 years ago I became friends with somebody that was trained by Elaine Ingham and 10 years ago, nobody really knew who she was. She wasn't popular like she is now. And um, he taught me everything I know about compost teas. He taught me how to use a microscope. He taught me how to brew a compost tea. He taught me what we're, why we're trying to do it, what we're looking for. We're looking for flagellates. We're looking for amoebas. We're looking for fungal hypha. Um, we're counting bacteria, all of that. So first we need to uh, differentiate a nutrient tea and a compost tea. They're completely different things. What Bruce is talking about is a nutrient tea. Um, it adds nutrients. You're not breeding. You're not brewing it for microbial activity. Um, okay. Compost tea is brewed for microbial activity only. You're trying to replicate the microbes from the compost and put feedstock into the water and and get more flagellates and get more amoebas and things like that and increase the bioavailability of nutrients in your soil via implementing higher rates of microbes into the soil via this compost tea. Um, that being said, um, the only way you know you're making a high quality compost tea is if you use a microscope. Other than wow. that, you're just shooting in the dark and I see everybody in the industry, I don't care if you're a farmer, it's not gonna hurt, it's not gonna be bad, you're not gonna kill your plants, but to say I make this awesome compost tea, you don't unless you have a microscope. If you put it on a slide and you can visibly see what's in it, that's a good compost tea. 
And the first, I remember when I, when my friend Brian was teaching me this, it was so funny. I was making the awesomest compost teas for years, right? And I took my first compost tea to him and I dropped a drop on the slide. I was like, check this out. Let's see it. And, he, and it was, there was nothing in it. Completely just water and like, uh, just like what, like sand and grit. That was it. I mean, you knocked I was the wind right out of your sail, huh? Yeah, it totally humbled the crap out of me just instantly. I was like, oh, my compost tea suck real bad, huh? So <laughs> that started like a two-year process. And so I ended up uh, spending two years designing my own line of compost tea brewers based off of me failing miserably at making compost teas once the right tools were in front of me to see that I was actually failing. You know, it's really interesting you say that, Chris, and appreciate the honesty, you know, and the humbleness there because, but it also shows whether you're a farmer of sugar beets or cantaloupes or cannabis, farmers will figure it out. You know, that's, that's what you guys do is you guys know how to grow and you read things. And so you knew your plant was doing good. You thought you were doing a great compost tea. Um, and, and then we're proven wrong by somebody who had more knowledge, but that's what farmers do is they will figure it out and they will progress and they will get better. Bryce, how about you? Do you use compost teas? I do use compost teas. Um, and I had a quick question to Chris's points. What, what would be the difference in a microbial tea and a nutrient tea? Would you not grow your microbial teas in a nutrient tea? Um, so when you do a nutrient tea, depending on what nutrient you put in there, it's going to dictate what microbes grow. And if you have multiple different nutrients in there, you're going to have different microbes competing and it's not going to be, it'd be easier to go and say, I'm like me personally, I add, um, alfalfa in, in my compost teas and I add some kelp meal and not liquid kelp. And I add fish hydrolysate. And all of that is for me to try to get a balanced tea with high levels of flagellates, high levels of amoebas, and high levels of bacteria. Now, if you want to go more fungal, you're going to put different inputs to try to steer that. But to try to steer like either high bacteria um, or high um, fungal or something like that, to try to do it all in the same one is going to be hard. That being said, none of them are bad. You're not hurting your plants. <laughs> like, it's not bad. <laughs> you know, I mean, unless it just smells rotten, it doesn't matter, you know? But, but if, we're, if we're only trying to get microbes, microscope you know you can get you can get a you can get an okay microscope for 400 bucks and and then you can really hand pick the microbes you want to um you want to breed for in those teas and uh, you know a couple more points on compost teas um i see too many people uh i don't know why 24 hours became the thing to brew a compost tea in that couldn't be further from the truth um that's not even anywhere i've, I've had like one compost tea in over a decade be done in 24 hours and it was the middle of summer and it was outside and it was like 90 degrees and it was in a like 32 gallon trash can and I just got lucky. Um, typically it's more like 36, 48 hours um, when your tea is going to be done. There's too many myths around compost teas because not enough people have a microscope to actually see what they're making. And um, I think most people just like I was will be highly disappointed <laughs> if you get to see your compost teas um, in person in a microscope. But again, it's not like hurting anything. You're not killing your plants and you just might not be you know, making as many microbes as you think you're making. All right, so let's move ahead a little bit to the composting of our leftover products. Um, Bruce, you were saying earlier, you do a lot of travel and you see a lot of grows. Um, have you, can you speak a little to what you've seen people doing uh, in composting their, their, uh, their leftover products? In other words, are you seeing them running through like a leaf shredder? Or are you seeing them just throw them in piles? Are you seeing cold compost, hot compost? How are you seeing them produce it? A little bit of both, and there's still a lot of that. Not knowing what to do with some people's piles. So I see some of the piles getting bigger and like, you know, they're not utilizing them right. Not, you know, like uh, me at home, you know, like anything I use waste-wise, go to an outdoor compost, I go to my beds for my outdoor plants because I do both indoor and outdoor. Um, so it kind of ultimately, and those, you know, those compost bins can get anywhere from like six months to like two years before I'll even touch them other than, you know, other than like returning and just making sure they're, you know, good and ready. Um, but like, uh, when it comes to like, it, it is kind of all over the map, but I, you know, I've seen a lot of going towards like biochar even too, people buying up, you know, old plant material to turn into biochar and then run that and compost and do so, you know, there's, it's kind of a, not a set thing I've seen yet. So it's, it's something I'm looking forward to more and more traction or seeing more and more traction happen with. 
You brought up an interesting point. So you're seeing people use um, their leftover products and, and turning it into biochar? Yeah, yeah, like or selling it to another company specifically because it's cannabis related, by, you know, and to, to turn it into biochar in that sense. So. Can you speak to biochar a little for us by chance? Like it, it's basically my understanding because we don't use biochar in our mixes, but you know, it's uh, burnt, car, you know, good, high carbon rich materials, good for a home for the microbes in a sense, um, for them to, you know, start doing their, you know, like reproducing, but you know, uh, work in a sense. Uh, but other than that, just burnt material, readily activated charcoal in a sense is the, the general gist of it. Okay. How about uh, Chris? Can you? Can you give us a little insight on what you've seen with your customers and both on the small and large scale? Or or are, the, are you guys with your system not composting it? Or are you literally just feeding it back to the soil? So with the way we do it, um, a lot, any, any so if you, if you go in and you pick off any leaf, you'll go through a grow. We just pick off a leaf, throw it on the pot, pick off a leaf, throw it on the pot, pick off a leaf, throw it on the pot. You can only do that so many times that you can sometimes get a buildup. And so there will be um, some excess, especially when you trim and things like that. And then the branches were obviously not, you know, any stems or stalks or anything we're not throwing on top. So that does need to be composted. I like the idea of biochar out of your stalks and things like that. I think that's a phenomenal idea. Um, I think more people need to use biochar. We obviously have it in our soil. Ours is made from beetle kill out of Colorado. Um, but I think that's, phenomenal that people are that, that's a great use of it now i would say though making proper biochar is a very specific um uh you know it's, it's very specific parameters to have actual biochar um you know you, it's, it's the lack of oxygen with the burning which doesn't make any sense at all because fire needs oxygen but there's that exact parameters you have to meet to actually have biochar other than that you're just making charcoal again it's like compost detox is it going to hurt your soil no is it going to be a microbe hotel Yes, but if you're gonna actually make biochar, there's specific parameters and you can make it out of, uh, there's oil drum setups you can uh, find plans on um, line to make your own for your backyard if you wanted to do that. But I think that's a great thing to do with stocks. I honestly never have considered that. Um, I, you know, the thing I see, unfortunately with the industry is that it's so strictly regulated across the country is that most people can't touch their waste at all. It, you have to pay the service and, and it's not waste. It, your extra material that you're not selling or whatever you wanna call it. You have to pay the service to haul it off for you, but at least in Oklahoma, they made specific rules that we can actually compost it on site as long as it's not like a usable bud. And that's awesome. And I think that's going to change uh, the way a lot of people look at it, and maybe it will change views in other states. Um, that's definitely one thing Oklahoma, the OMMA is really, I think, done well on is uh, making that just even available for us to do that on site. I couldn't agree more, Chris. And, and you know, a lot like Oklahoma has been a leader in this industry of teaching. Uh, I mean, we've been the Wild West uh, to hear from places around the, the other country, but obviously we've done pretty successful at it. I mean, uh, Oklahoma growers, um, dispensaries and so forth have been um, uh, successful. And I think that to promote compost and the use of our of our byproducts and to not have them put into the the landfills, obviously, this is a big deal. So hopefully Oklahoma can be the leader in that and, and continue to show that. Bryce, we need to move on. We're running out of time. But do you have anything to add to that? I would just reiterate what Chris said. It's, it's a specific process on making biochar. Um, and there's parameters you got to abide by. Uh, you got to be careful to use fresh biochar that hadn't been treated because um, it can actually rob your plants of nutrients if, uh, if not done correctly. Uh, but that's really all I got to add to that. We're here with top dressing. Um, can we top dress with uh, compost? Obviously, we know we can do that. Could we, can we top dress with our leftover materials, i.e. the leaves, the trimmings, the stems, especially if we shredded them up? Say we put them through, the, through a, uh, a leaf shredder, um, you know, one you could buy at Home Depot. Um, is that something that we could then add back to our soil on, uh, by applying it to the top, topically applying it, rather than having to go through the compost process? And if so, have you guys used that, that system? Like I, I would, 
personally reserve it like it um depending if you know say if you're doing like a larger pot sizes or the like the bigger depending again depending on the grow if you're trying to crank the plants out in smaller pots or if you're outside in a field or if you have time for them to actually naturally break down because like say if you're cranking smaller pots in indoors and they're you know you're throwing leaves on top you're still not you're gonna get some breakdown but at some point too if you're not if you're not pretty much growing the soil the right way if it's not really uh, you're not using the soil long enough, you're just going to get a bunch of leaves on top of soil as well. Uh, so it really depends on the scale of the grow. So like uh, me and the smaller size pots, I don't do it, but my outdoor beds, my outdoor plants, my bigger size pots, I do. So. Sorry, Bryce. I was muted. <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> uh, I would just reiterate what Bruce said. Uh, we do smaller pots indoors and um, I just don't feel that it, the, the nutrients have that time to break down to be uh, available for my plants, uh, especially since we're in a 60 day window between getting into our flower room and harvesting. Uh, but if I were outdoor, uh, of course, I would, I would put that right back on top of the ground and um, get used for next year. So I kind of left you for last there on Chris on purpose, because obviously we're with your system, we're probably going to do that. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's designed to do that. It's that's what Mother Nature does. The fact that in the fall, the leaves fall and they by the spring, they're gone and they're eaten up and they've been turned into compost and they feed the plants the next year. Why are we trying to change that? None of us are smarter than that. None of us. I've met one person that's smarter than that. Bro, so Bruce is doing a smaller grow inside, whereas he can well, use his leftovers outdoors. Yeah, I would say, though, indoors, <laughs> like if you're using soil indoors and using it for one run, it makes zero sense to try to put leaves on. Right. It. Now, I will say you would get the benefit of the mulch trapping in moisture, and then you would actually lower how much water you need in those pots if you did put it on top. And so it's not going to have enough time to break down. You're not going to have enough microbial activity in a standard soil and things like that, but you're still going to get that mulch effect and uh, retain the moisture in your pot. So you would get some benefit, but at the same time, it could be a vector because you don't have your pot set up like how we have them set up. And so you could bring a vector and it could be a pest issue and things like that. So there's a lot of, lot to consider. And again, sure. you just gotta, it, it, there's no right answer. Every, there's a million ways to grow a plant and uh, you just gotta do what's right for you and, and for your garden. Second question too. All right, so we've got some questions from the panelists we need to hit because we're uh, running a little long on time and we'll try and get these all in. Um, the question is, do the panelists have data on cannabis yield differences from using compost versus not using compost? Um, that's a great question and one we need to get to today for sure. So um, in your experiences, um, have you seen, so we've talked about hydro grow versus growing in living soil a few times already throughout the, this, this conversation. Are we seeing yield differences? You know, Bruce, you spoke to the tomatoes big and it's pretty and it's grown hydroponically, but it doesn't, the, the quality of the tomato is not there. So Bruce, I'm going to hit you first. What, have you seen uh, yield differences in organic versus not, uh, I'm sorry, growing with compost versus not using compost? Unmute, Bruce. Unmute. Yeah, no, it's like um, yeah, I do. Like um, and, but I'll, I I use that loosely because it really depends on the, a lot of it depends on the grower too, because you can grow you know a good yield on crappy nutrients and it's still gonna you know be a good yield of crappy stuff, or you can grow a good yield good yield on good nutrients and you just it really boils down to use using the products right or using knowing what you're basically what you're doing. Um, you know, like I, one of my f favorite farms I deal with, they're, they're, they went from going from one pound of light to about three pounds of light in the last year and a half, just, you know, finally tuning their plants, what they're doing. I mean, terpene flavor is amazing compared to what other walkthroughs have grown, you know, gone through, um, growing the same strains in a sense, but growing it inorganically or completely differently. So, I mean, the yield is always going to be there if you're, you know, if you're growing correctly or you know what you're doing in a sense, or you kind of fine tune it, but and, like the quality will depend on what you're using or how you're doing it. You're mute. You're mute. Man. Sorry. Hi, Chris. Uh, so, <laughs> Chris, can you speak to some yield differences with or without compost? Um, everybody hates me on this question. Um, it, it's about quality. It's about terpenes. If you are getting three a light, or I mean, I see, I saw somebody getting like three and a half a light of some freaking like rock hard drill buds that get you high for five minutes that probably completely smell 
horrible and taste horrible, well, that's not a very good parameter to set for, uh, you know, is your grow successful? Um, you have to find a balance. And I think there is a balance of quality and yields. And obviously it is a business. Um, you, you know, again, the compost and compost materials and the aging of the soil and things like that, it, it just leads to a higher quality product. And then once you reach where you feel like your product is a high enough quality, then I think you should start working on yields. Um, you, you know, again, I, I, I'm, I just don't, I'm not the guy for that answer because yields aren't what's important. You know, if, if, again, you, know, if you get three and a, if you get three and a half pounds of, of, of not good product, a light is three and a half pounds of not good product. I'd rather have a, you know, pound and a half of high quality product. And there's a line waiting out the door, you know, buyers for your product. You know, no, instead, absolutely. And I, yeah. I think that we all agree with that. Absolutely. And, and so, but I, so I, if I understand you correctly, you are, you are going to agree that compost helps get that quality. Oh, hundred percent. You cannot get the highest quality. Again, let's, let's stop trying to reinvent stuff. Let's look out in nature. The redwoods, is anybody out there feeding bottles to the redwoods? No, is anybody, if we can go through the prairie and look at the grass, anything, it's all being fed naturally. And all I do is I just bring it inside and do the same thing uh, and try to mimic it. And it's all based off composted material and living inside and composting inside the container. And it just elevates the quality of the end product. 100%. Bryce, how about you? Have you seen yield differences or have you, are you chasing the quality much like Chris is saying? Uh, much like Chris is saying, it's all about quality when it comes to soil health and using compost to use. Um, it's, it's definitely not about the yield. If, um, and, and, you know, if, you, if you're concerned about yield, you got to really look at uh, when it comes to cannabis genetics. Uh, that's one thing I've been really fortunate with is since day one of my uh, experience with cannabis, I've been using seed. Um, my first grow, I was harvesting every week. And then from there, I was either harvesting every two weeks or every 10 days, depending on what year you're talking about. Um, so I got to see a ton of different genetics and using some of the same compost uh, in soils, um, we're getting different yields based off of genetics. Some genetics love what I'm doing. I uh, love the soil that I'm providing uh, where another genetic won't grow in it at all. Um, so that's kind of where I go uh, with saying that not all composts are created e equal, not all soils are created equal, um, and cannabis is very unique in, in the fact that uh, every genetic wants different nutrients, different uh, moisture content, different oxygen content in soil or in its uh, soil. Um, so yeah, if you're if you're super concerned about yield, um, you know. Focus on your genetics and uh, keep the quality high by using soil and compost. I want to try and get to one of them is we had a question about the uh, what what they called waste products result from growing and processing medical marijuana and how are these prop and how are these products disposed of? It was mentioned that okay, Oklahoma is unique in that the state allows composting of waste material on site. But uh, what other waste materials are produced that are unable to be composted? Would these products be a concern for local water quality? So I'm going to take the question um, as far as the composted products go. Uh, as far as water quality goes, absolutely not. Um, any, any compostable product coming from a cannabis plant or any other living, growing plant will compost and not affect the water quality specifically if composted correctly. Um, as far as um, anything that might be left over in the processing of um, cannabis, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming they're, they're referring to, say, the uh, refining of it and so forth um, to where we're going to make resins and things like that. Uh, Bryce, can you take over for us there? Can you give us, is there, is there anything we need to worry about on water quality issues with processing uh, cannabis products? You're muted, by the way. Uh, I think you were talking to me, Jason. I was, a of, yes. A lot of that was cut out. 
Oh, okay. So the question is, um, we know that the, the living part of the cannabis plant, we can compost. And the question, there was concern with water quality, if we were going to hurt anything with water quality while doing the composting process. And then they also mentioned in, in specific the um, processing of medical marijuana. So I'm, I'm assuming they're talking about maybe when we're processing to make resins and so forth. And they're worried about um, the leftovers from that. And is there any environmental impacts from those processes? Uh, if you're using all organic methods, I wouldn't think so. Uh, if you're using high nitrogen fertilizers in your product, then maybe you would have a problem with, a problem with the, the byproduct water coming off your compost. Uh, I have no experience in that. Uh, now, as far as processing material, uh, I've also had three different labs, uh, BHO extraction, CO2 extraction, now I'm working with ethanol extraction. Uh, I have not seen any differences besides terpene levels um, when you're talking about the oil coming off of the plants. Um, you know, there are fertilizer grown uh, grows that they have very, very high cannabinoid uh, yields. Um, so that, that's kind of my experience on that. As far as uh, soil and compost, it just increases your terpenes uh, in extraction. So we've got a question for you um, in specific. What are we looking for in the microscope to determine good compost tea? So we have like six more hours left. Is that what we're going to do? <laughs> no, we're going to have to try and do it quick. All right. So I'll do it real quick. And then first off, I want to say I checked out Bryce's Instagram and he does definitely go for quality. And I appreciate that. It's, it's this, in this Oklahoma market. You guys know that's hard to come by, unfortunately. Um, but so um, as far as the microbes, I would start with um, amoebas, which is going to look like a little jellyfish that mutates and moves and spreads. Um, and you have to look real closely and you need a 1500 times microscope. Um, it's, it's like a biological microscope. You can get a, you know, you can get a cheaper one for like 400 bucks. Totally worth it. Um, and then you want to do flagellates, which flagellates look basically like a sperm. Uh, it's a round ball with the tail coming off of it. You can watch them split in real life and, and create themselves uh, and multiply. Um, and then bacteria will just be a little dot or an oval and they'll be bouncing around everywhere. You'll see mostly bacteria. And then fungal hypha will look like uh, strings or branches of a tree and things like that. And depending on what you're trying to brew for, um, I always have just gone after because my soil is already fungally dominant because I built it that way and I keep making it that way. So I don't really try to breed fungal hyphae in my um, compost teas. So I go after flagellates, amoebas, and bacteria. And so basically all you're doing is increasing nutrient cycling and making new more nutrients bioavailable in the soil by increasing how many microbes are available. And so I, I did want to say something about compost teas. And so in my journey of creating compost tea brewers for two years, um, I became addicted to them. I was a, a compost tea addict. And a lot of people are compost tea addicts. And um, I learned some things, unfortunately, that are detrimental to your soil if you're a compost tea addict. Um, first off, your sodium levels are going to go off the chart. You're going to, your sodium levels are going to be so high in your soil, especially if you're reusing your soil all the time. If you use a compost tea once a week, and I have a lot of customers doing it, your sodium levels are always going to be jacked, and you're going to unbalance your soil. Um, the, and you think you're going to be doing good, but long term, you're going to be doing bad. So you want to be more reserved. I don't ever use one more than once a month. You can use them every other week uh, or something like that, and that would be fine. Um, but then also something I didn't even think of is we had a customer using cotton burr compost. Well, if anybody knows about cotton, arsenic and cotton go hand in hand. And so he called me and he was like, your soil made my levels go too high and I flunked my OMA test. No, you didn't. <laughs> I mean, you did flunk it, but it wasn't the soil. And I told him, I, I, and, we, and it, it was a long conversation. I was getting yelled at for a long time. And finally, after like 20 minutes, we got down to cotton burr compost. And I was like, Mm, why don't you change that and see what happens? Changed it, and not a problem, done. So you really got to be specific and think about what you're doing and all your inputs. And, and not all compost is equal. Um, it's not. And I would also think the same thing about any uh, chicken litter or turkey litter compost because they put arsenic in the feed to kill the mice and the rats in the hen houses. Um, and so that transfers into their poop and their feathers and things like that. And so, yes, it can be composted, but those don't typically compost down um, like other things. And uh, so you wanna, you wanna definitely be aware of that when you're making compost teas. And, you, and you, that's why I say don't ever overuse it. Well, we sure appreciate it today. We've unfortunately ran out of time. I know we could do this for hours and hours. Thanks to all of our panelists, Bruce, Chris, Bryce. Thank you very much. Your knowledge and help today was 
Awesome. Uh, Eric, I think we're going to send it back over, or Mark. Mark, we're sending it back to you. Aren't we? Yes, Thanks. we are. Thank you all. Yeah. Um, thank you all again so much for, for doing this. A um, few closing remarks, not about your great content. Jason did a great job with all that. Uh, just a reminder for those who had signed up or registered for the full suite of sessions, um, these last four sessions uh, that we did on Thursdays, you'll get an email if you haven't already to this afternoon or in the morning telling you about the link to join us for our grounds for discussion uh, session. That's tomorrow, Friday at 4.20 p.m., of course, uh, over Zoom. And that'll be a more you know interactive for the 30 or so folks who had signed up for all of the sessions that we've done about composting, uh, scaling the compost mountain uh, in October and November. So be watching for that. Uh, thank you again to all of the sponsors that I named earlier and our panelists, of course, and the Oklahoma Compost Conference Planning Committee who put it together in this little bit different format this year. And for those of you curious about the recording, panelists or attendees, uh, we should have that um, processed and up um, probably by Monday or so. So if you were registered for this session or were one of the um, panelists, of course, or the speakers at a previous session, we'll send you the link to the recording of this. Um, unless panelists, you all are against that. I can't remember if we agree, we asked you about that. I should have if we didn't already. Are you okay with us sending out the recording? <laughs> okay, good. Uh, so I'll give that to you if you want to share it out, of course, um, or other folks wanted to to grab that to glean some more great information. Um, with that, I'll stop talking and then panelists, if you would stick around for a quick screenshot so we can get a picture to put up on social media, um, I'd appreciate it. Everybody have a great afternoon.